Hello everyone, Dr. Mad here. Let's get mad about a Christmas carol. So we are halfway through stay three, and stay three is actually the longest one, okay? Just to let you know. And this is where we left off. So just a reminder that the second spirit has taken Scrooge to his clerk's house, Bob Cratchit, and we have seen the family being happy and enjoying Christmas and celebrating despite the fact that they don't have much food, despite the fact that they don't have much, the, school, the house is small, but despite all that, they are happy in their family life. And now dinner is over and the father is proposing a toast. A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us, which all the family re-echoed. God bless us every one, said Tiny Tim, the last of all. He sat very close to his father's side upon his little stool. Bob held his withered little hand in his, as if he loved the child and wished to keep him by his side and dreaded that he might be taken from him. Okay, so this is fairly straightforward. Drinking a toast and they all do the same. And then we've got Tiny Tim here sitting by his father. So withered means, usually means dried up, but here means shriveled up okay now be careful here where it says as if he loved the child now today we might interpret that to mean that he's pretending but language changes slightly over time so here it doesn't mean that and it's not really being used as a simile even though as if is normally a simile here dickens is actually emphasizing that obviously he loves his little son and he's dreading that the boy is going to die and in fact in those days he would have died because there was no health service and this family cannot afford any kind of health care. But just a little bit of a spoiler alert, he will be saved because Scrooge is going to help him at the end of the book. Okay. Spirit, said Scrooge, with an interest he had never felt before. Tell me if Tiny Tim will live. I see a vacant seat, replied the ghost, in the poor chimney corner and a crutch without an owner, carefully preserved. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. No, no, said Scrooge. Oh, no, kind spirit. Say he will be spared. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, none other of my race, returned the ghost, will find him here. What then? If he be like to die, he had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Scrooge hung his head to hear his own words quoted by the spirit and was overcome with penitence and grief. Okay, so yeah, as we can see here, Scrooge is showing an interest that he would not normally have shown before. And he asks if T Tiny Tim will live, and the ghost basically says no. So this vacant, empty seat is where, in the future, Tiny Tim should have sat, but he won't be there, he'll be dead. And a crutch, so remember Tiny Tim has a crutch, and now that his Tim is dead, the crutch doesn't have an owner, but the family, so preserve means to keep, the family have kept the crutch as a reminder of Tim. And he's saying, so here shadows means you could say possibility. So remember, now we are in the present. We are not in the past. So in the past, when the ghost said shadows, he meant the memories of that time. Now he's talking about the possibilities that if things don't change, then yes, Tiny Tim is going to die. And Scrooge obviously doesn't want this to happen, but the ghost repeats that it will happen. And not him, not this ghost, nor any other like him. Remember, he's, there are many other ghosts like, like him. But then he says this phrase here. Do you remember this phrase? Who said it and when? So this was back in, chap in stave one. When the two men came to get charity and Scrooge used these words which are from which economist? Thomas Malthus. So basically he was saying that if people die they should just be allowed to die. Nature will take care of the population. Uh, the population will be what it is if you just leave it alone. And Scrooge is hangs his head. In other words he's ashamed. Penitence and grief. So grief means sadness. Penitence is regret, but it has religious 
connotations, or you can say great re regret. Man, said the ghost, if man you be in heart, not adamant, forbear that wicked cant until you have discovered what the surplus is and where it is. Will you decide what men shall live, what men shall die? It may be that in the sight of heaven you are more worthless and less fit to live than millions like this poor man's child. O oh God, to hear the insect on the leaf pronouncing on the too much life among his hungry brothers in the dust. Okay, so uh, this paragraph is important. So he says, man, says the ghost. So he could be talking to Scrooge individually or human beings in general. And he's saying, if you really are human in heart and adamant and stubborn, unchanging, Forbear means to hold back that wicked cant. Now, this is an actual word. It's not a misspelling. It means hypocritical talk. And here, he's saying, until you know what you're talking about, who you're talking about, and where those people live, stop talking hypocritically. Okay? You are not the one who should decide who shall live and who should die. And saying that in the sight of God or heaven, Maybe you, you might be rich, but maybe you're less fit, that you're more worthless than poor little tiny Tim. Who are you to judge? And then this li next line is a bit confusing. It's a, it's a metaphor. So to hear the insect on the leaf. So it's a metaphor to say, so the insect on the leaf is obviously fine. It's eating the leaf and it's not hungry. But then it's talking down to the, its fellow insects on the ground, which are hungry because they can't eat the dust, right? So he said, so the insect on the leaf is the rich people and they're kind of pronouncing on talking down to the poor people, telling them how to live and that kind of thing. But they've got nothing to live on. Scrooge bent before the ghost's rebuke and trembling cast his eyes upon the ground, but he raised them speedily on hearing his own name. Mr. Scrooge, said Bob. I'll give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. The founder of the feast indeed, cried Mrs. Cratchit, reddening. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon, and I hope he'd have a good appetite for it. My dear, said Bob, the children, Christmas Day. It should be Christmas Day, I'm sure, said she, on which one drinks the health of such an odious, stingy, hard, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. You know he is, Robert. Nobody knows it better than you do, poor fellow. My dear, was Bob's mild answer. Christmas Day. Okay, and then here, so Scrooge looks down. He's ashamed. And then this page is a bit confusing if you don't realize what's going on. So he hears his own name. So you might think that the family are calling out to him, but actually... Bob is raising a toast to Mr. Scrooge himself, okay, his, his employer. So the founder of the feast, so founder means somebody who starts something, but in this case, more like provider, okay, and there's a technique as well, alliteration. So I suppose on the one hand, Bob is being charitable, okay, but also he's thinking that Scrooge is his employer, and even though he's a terrible employer, and he probably pays him the bare minimum he can get away with, Nevertheless, he is giving him a job, he is paying him, and that money is paying for this dinner. So that's why Miss, that's why Bob is raising a toast to him. But Mrs. Cratchit, she goes red and says, she does. She obviously doesn't like him. She's saying, if he was here, I would give her, him a piece of my mind to feast upon. So this is a metaphor. And when she says that he should have a, a good appetite, obviously this is normally for food, but here she's talking about an appetite for her words. In other words, he would have to sit there and listen and eat her words. But he says, oh, don't don't talk like that in front of the children. And she's saying, well, only on Christmas Day would what, could one possibly drink to this health of this man because he's horrible. Ex odious means extremely unpleasant. So stingy, I'm sure you know what that means. Hard, unfeeling. I mean, hard and unfeeling are the same, really. But... Dickens is using this list to 
show us what Mrs. Cratchit thinks of Mr. Scrooge. And she says, you know he's like that, and you know it better than anyone because you have to work for him. But he just says, mild means gentle, so he stays calm and says, oh, look, it's Christmas Day. I'll drink his health for your sake and the days, said Mrs. Cratchit, not for his. Long life to him, a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. He'll be very merry and very happy, I have no doubt. The children drank the toast after her. It was the first of their proceedings, which had no heartiness. Tiny Tim drank it last of all, but he didn't care two tuppence for it. He didn't care two pence for it. Scrooge was the ogre of the family. The mention of his name cast a dark shadow on the party, which was not dispelled for full five minutes. So she says, OK, I'll drink for your sake and because it's Christmas, but not for him. And then these words here, she says them, but obviously she's being sarcastic. She doesn't really mean them. And the children drink the toast as well. But so this line here means that it's the first thing they've done so far, which they don't really believe in. Their hearts are not in it. OK, and similarly with Tiny Tim. And Ogre is a man-eating giant or just a nasty, horrible person. And that toast kind of makes the family go a bit gloomy for a minute. For five, well, for five minutes, they here. So dispel means to get rid of, to make something disappear. So it takes them five minutes to forget about Scrooge. And probably what we can infer here, what we can work out is that they hear stories about Scrooge from, from Bob Cratchit, maybe Scrooge makes him work late, that kind of thing, okay? And just doesn't treat him well, keeps him cold, all these stories they, they will have heard from Bob Cratchit. After it had passed away, they were ten times merrier than before, from the mere relief of Scrooge the baleful being done with. Bob Cratchit told them how he had a situation in his eye for Master Peter, which would bring in, if obtained, full five and sixpence weekly. The two young Cratchits laughed tremendously at the idea of Peter's being a man of business, and Peter himself looked thoughtfully at the fire from between his collars, as if he were deliberating what particular investments he should favour when he came into the receipt of that bewildering income. Martha, who was a poor apprentice at a milliner's, then told them what kind of work she had to do, and how many hours she worked at a stretch, and how she meant to lie abed tomorrow morning for a good long rest, tomorrow being a holiday she passed at home. Also, how she had seen a countess and a lord some days before, and how the lord was much about as tall as Peter's, at which, Chris, at which Peter pulled up his collar, collar so high that you couldn't have seen his head if you had been there. All this time the chestnuts and the jug went round and round, and by and by they had a song about a lost child travelling in the snow from Tiny Tim, who had a plaintive little voice and sang it very well indeed. Okay, so that's a long paragraph there. Let's just go through it. So after they've forgotten Scrooge, they're ten times happier be simply because that's a relief. The baleful means menacing, threatening harm. And then Bob Cratchit, the father, tells them that he may have found a job for Peter, his older son, and which pays five and sixpence, which is about 30p, something like that, 31p. It's about half of Bob Cratchit, so, and then it says here that the kids laugh at the idea of Peter working, but Peter looks thoughtful, and then he's thinking about how he's going to invest that money when he, when he gets it, bewildering income, so confusing income in the sense that we know that it wasn't much money, even then, obviously it would, be, would have been more than it is now. But to him, it seemed like a lot of money. And Martha, who's an apprentice, as you, I'm sure you know what that means. So Milanese are hat makers, and she describes how hard the work is, how many hours she has to work. So remember, no working conditions, no laws to protect you in those days. You were at the mercy of your employer, and she says she's going to have a 
a lie-in the next morning, so she happened to have a day off. And then she just tells the story about seeing some countess and a lord, which we don't need to worry too much about. Okay. And then they're just eating their chestnuts and drinking. So again, Dickens just painting a picture of this family enjoying themselves. And then Tiny Tim sings a song. So plaintive means sad and mournful. And he obviously sings very nicely. There is nothing of high mark in this. They were not a handsome family. They were not well dressed. Their shoes were far from being waterproof. Their clothes were scanty. And Peter might have known, and very likely did, the inside of a pawnbroker's. But they were happy, grateful, pleased with one another, and contented with the time. And when they faded, and looked happier yet in the bright sprinklings of the spirit's torch at parting, Scrooge had his eye upon them, and especially on Tiny Tim, until the last. Okay, so here, this line just means that there's nothing particularly different about this. So as a family, they would often sing and have dinner together and, and be happy as a family. And here, Dickens really just summarizes, if you like, what he's been describing in detail up till now. Okay, so they're not well dressed, shoes are not very waterproof, scanty means small amount. So both in the sense that they don't have many clothes and the ones they do have are secondhand, repaired. And Peter may have been inside a pawnbroker's meaning. So a pawnbroker is a shop where you go and you give, you can borrow money and you give them something. And if you don't pay the money back, then they keep what you gave them. Okay. So they were very common in those days. They still sort of exist. And in fact, they're kind of coming back actually because of the current lost cost of living crisis and all that. But they're happy and grateful, happy with each other, happy with the time. And here, and when they faded, so what's happening here is now the ghost is going to take Scrooge away now. So they start to move away and fade away into the distance. But they're happy, especially because the spirit sprinkles a bit, a few more drops of magic water or whatever is in the torch. So the, remember the torch gives just not just light, this one, but also holy water sort of thing. But Scrooge kind of keeps looking at them and especially on Tiny Tim until they kind of disappear into the distance. By this time it was getting dark and snowing pretty heavily. And as Scrooge and the spirit went along the streets, the brightness of the roaring fires in kitchens, parlours and all sorts of rooms was wonderful. Here, the flickering of the blaze showed preparations for a cosy dinner, with hot plates baking through and through before the fire and deep red curtains ready to be drawn to shut out cold and darkness. Then all the children of the house were running out into the snow to meet their married sisters, brothers, cousins, uncles, aunts, and be the first to greet them. Here, again, were shadows on the window blind of guests assembling, and there a group of handsome girls, all hooded and fur-booted, and all chattering at once, tripped lightly off to some near neighbour's house, where, woe upon the single man who saw them enter, artful witches, well they knew it, in a glow. Okay, so... This is fairly straightforward, it's getting dark, snowing heavily, Scrooge and the spirit are walking along the streets, and they can see fires inside the houses, in the fireplaces, not that the houses are on fire, uh, kitchens, parlours, so these are living rooms, and it's all wonderful. So remember, this is all foreign to Scrooge. At this point, at this time, Scrooge would normally be sitting alone in his office or at home, so all this family and people getting together and, and enjoying themselves, this is not something he normally does or and nothing that he normally sees. And people are getting ready for dinner and there's these curtains. So nothing really to understand here as such. This is just Dickens describing people being together and being happy. And the children come running out of the house to meet their married sisters who obviously would live in a different house or other relatives coming to visit. And yeah, so here Scrooge and the ghost can see on the, through the windows, people coming and meeting each other. 
and here's some girls handsome normally nowadays we only use it for men but it can apply to women as well just means in this case pretty or good looking or whatever and they're all it's cold so hooded and fur booted they're all talking together just having a good time going to some ha neighbor's house houses and then this line is dickens just being a bit humorous that if there's any single men in there so the girls are going to come in a glow because they're red from the cold and they come into the heat so artful witches i mean he's being fun uh, humorous here that they're flirty and woe upon the single man in other words they are going to impress the the young single men and attract them obviously okay so but if you had judged from the numbers of people on their way to friendly gatherings you might have thought that no one was at home to give them welcome when they got there instead of every house expecting company and piling up its fires half chimney high blessings on it how the ghost exulted how it bared its breath of breast and opened its capacious palm and floated on outpouring with a generous hand its bright and harmless mirth on everything within its reach the very lamplighter who ran on before dotting the dusky street with specks of light and who was dressed to spend the evening somewhere laughed out loudly as the spirit passed though little kenned the light lamplighter that he had any company for christmas okay so here dickens is just being a bit humorous so he's saying that with all these people out and about you might think well no one's at home obviously somebody must be home normally people would meet at their parents houses right so normally the parents would be home and all the younger people would be going to visit them so that's what dickens means there and the people are piling the fireplaces high to have a nice big roaring fire unlike scrooge's tiny fire in the office okay and the ghost is overjoyed to see this and gives more blessings on everybody it bears its breath its breast sorry chest and capacious means big lots of space opens up its hands floats on and gives blessings with its hand maybe with its torch as well although dickens doesn't mention the torch here and mirth means fun laughter amusement so it's giving out fun and laughter to everybody blessing everybody the very lamp lighter so in those days lamps were not electric they did have lamps but they were chemical and you literally had somebody going around and lighting them every night so basically big torches and but as you can see here specks of light so small amounts of light so obviously the lamps were not very big but they just gave enough light for people to see and walk and he's actually going to go out once he's done his job he's going to go to somebody's house presumably as well and as the spirit passes he laughs because without realizing it so ken means to know so he doesn't realize the the spirit is there but the spirit but his the spirit's presence blesses him and makes him even happier and now without a word of warning from the ghost they stood upon a bleak and desert moor where monstrous masses of rude stone were cast about as though it were the burial place of giants and water spread itself wheresoever it listed or would have done so but for the frost that held it prisoner and nothing grew but moss and firs and coarse rank grass down in the west the setting sun had left a streak of fiery red which glared upon the desolation for an instant like a sullen eye and frowning lower 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 yet was lost in the thick gloom of darkest night now this next paragraph is a bit confusing if you don't understand what's going on and part of the confusion is is deliberate but basically they are now in a totally different place okay they've gone from this town where the people are celebrating into this wild area okay so without a warning bleak means wild open desert same thing again more is a wide open wild area where nothing much is growing so monstrous means huge masses of rude stone so rude here is not when somebody's rude to somebody else it just means rough 
wild stone just spread about everywhere. This is a wild open area, as though it were the burial place of giants. So it's just that's a, obviously a simile that Dickens is using to show that this place is really wild and deserted, and water is spreading about. Where it lists, so list means to lean. So basically saying that the the ground is uneven because it's not looked after, it's not cultivated, and but the water is actually not moving because it's so cold that it's frozen, okay? And nothing is growing but moss and furs. So furs is gorse, but gorse you might not know either. It's just a yellow plant. Coarse means rough, rank means like very smelly grass, okay? And then there's this, the sun is setting in the west, and a streak means like a, a stripe of fiery red. Now, normally, a red sunset would be a lovely thing, but here, because of the the nature of the area, it's not nice, okay? So it glares, and obviously Dickens is using personification again. Notice he uses a lot of personification, and that's a good trick to learn from Dickens for your own creative and descriptive writing in your other GCSE. Desolation, again, means empty. So the sun is glaring down on this empty, wild place like a sullen eye. So again, simile and personification. Sullen means sad and, and gloomy. And frowning, lower, lower, lower yet. Repetition. But then this last bit here says that the sunset only lasts for a, a moment and then the sun goes down and suddenly it's all dark night. So what I'll do is I'll just read this page. I won't explain it. I'll just read it for the end of this video and then I'll explain it in the next video. What place is this, asked Scrooge? A place where miners live, who labor in the bowels of the earth, returned the spirit. But they know me, see? A light shone from the window of a hut, and swiftly they advanced towards it. Passing through the wall of mud and stone, they found a cheerful company assembled round a glowing fire, an old, old man and woman, with their children and their children's children, and another generation beyond that, all decked out gaily in their holiday attire. The old man, in a voice that seldom rose above the howling of the wind upon the barren waste, was singing them a Christmas song. It had been a very old song when he was a boy, and from time to time they all joined in the chorus. So surely as they raised their voices, the old man got quite blithe and loud, and so surely as they stopped, his vigour sank again. The spirit did not tarry here, but bade Scrooge hold his robe, and passing on above the moor, sped whither? Not to see? To see. To Scrooge's horror, looking back, he saw the last of the land, a frightful range of rocks behind them, and his ears were deafened by a thundering of water as it rolled and roared and raged among the dreadful caverns it had worn and fiercely tried to undermine the earth. Okay, so I'm going to stop there and just end on this slide as always. If you found this video useful, please do subscribe and tell all your friends about it. And I will see you in the next video where I'll explain that last page and carry on with Stave 3.